as a sermon, we're all done. And the reason I say this is I'm just going to be prophetic today. And it's not that I'm not prophetic every week. It's just you don't know that I'm being prophetic. Put your seatbelts on. Or put your neighbor's seatbelt on because you're just feeling reckless. <laughs> I have had on my heart for a month. A story about David that I believe is the singular pivotal point that changed absolutely everything. And I've wanted to preach it, and I was all ready to preach it this Sunday, but then I realized, well, actually, I was ready to preach it last week, but then I realized, no, I should probably talk about his mighty men first. And so we remember the mighty men last week, remember? Yeah. Some of us are, some of you are going to be people who have great statistics. Praise God. But every, all the rest of us, we can still be mighty men just because we did what God put in front of us. It's you being you, filled with him, open for business. And whether it's killing 800 at one time or having your hand fused to the sword or killing a lion on a snowy day in a pit, in a pit, it doesn't matter. You're, we can all be mighty men. Praise God. Praise God. So I said, Phew, okay. you got that done. And I said, okay, now I get to preach the message I need to preach, and it's actually going to be a good Sunday. And as I started working on it, I realized it, I, I made a mistake. I actually read the Bible. Okay? So I realized it's not one story, but it's actually two stories. And it's the story of David, and it's the story of Saul. So I thought, all right, well, I'll just tell the story of David and Saul this week. Next week, we'll have a great message. So I got started, and I was all ready to go Thursday, and Friday morning I got to church, and again, I made the mistake of reviewing what I had done the day before. And, and you're going, what, you're just hearing these sermons for the first time on Sunday? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and I looked at it, and I go, oh my gosh, this is going to be three hours. And I know I always say, you know, a better pastor would divide this into two, but today you're stuck with me. So I decided, finally, I'm going to do it, I'm going to divide it in two. So you're going to have an okay week this week and a great week next week. <laughs> We've done that. We've survived that, right? Yeah. Right. <sighs> and then I made the mistake yesterday of actually reading the Bible again. And I realized that this amazing story with David that covers two stories of David and Saul actually starts... Before David and Saul. And I thought, well, I have to do that. And, and folks, this is what happened. You know, Saturdays are my Sabbath day. Saturday is the day where I kind of pray for three or four hours. And it's, it's my recouping day. And I put my Bible down and it flopped open to Samuel, 1 Samuel 4, which, of course, is leading into the story of David and Saul that I've been alluding to. And I just thought, oh, there, there's something there. And then I started reading. And I remember in 2017, God woke me up out of a dead sleep with this story I'm going to tell today. And then in 2000, because then earlier in 2000, I was say 12, I was at a regional worship group. And God gave me a prophetic word. And the two linked together. So I just got that feeling of, oh, boy. I got to do this. So first service survived, kind of. So please understand, can you just, can you just track with me? Amen. You're going to have a good sermon in three weeks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can't guarantee the next two weeks, and I certainly can't guarantee today. But I'm just going to jump in, and we're going to go until I get hungry. Um, so we'll have comfort food after? Comfort, a lot of comfort food after. <laughs> So here's, here's where we're going with this. The, the whole Bible is a story of the Spirit of God dealing with man. From creation where the Spirit is, is over the earth to the Old Testament where, where the whole Old Testament is a story of how the Holy Spirit is moving on the earth. And it starts with, we find the Holy Spirit in Moses. He had so much of the Spirit on him, they were able to divide it up, pass it on to elders. And then the Holy Spirit goes to Joshua. And the children of Israel go into... The promised land. And then the Holy Spirit then goes on judges. Yes. One at a time. Until finally we see Samuel rise up. And the Spirit of God comes on him. And Samuel anoints the kings. Do you see the connection between David and Saul? Yeah. 
Now, in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is in us. In the Old Testament, God was up there. When Jesus walked around, God was over there. Just on Jesus. But after the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit is in us. So it's, it's, you always have to look at the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament. Unless you want to be Jewish. You certainly can, but that's why we're Christian and not Jewish. We're in the New Covenant. All right. So this story completely blew my mind four years ago. The story starts out, Saul, uh, Samuel is now the prophet who became a priest who anointed kings. Prophet, priest, king. Who does that sound like? Jesus. Jesus. So it's, it's a picture of Jesus early, early on in the Old Testament. And in this story, he goes and the nation of Israel attacks the Philistines, their sworn enemy, and gets soundly defeated by the Philistines. Now again, remember, Old Testament battles are physical God's enemies are empowering the other nations to fight against Israel in physical hand-to-hand -hand combat. New Testament, our battles are spiritual. We get that part. But in the Old Testament, Satan is working through the Philistines. They ransack Israel. And they take the Ark of the Covenant. How many people remember Raiders of the Lost Ark? Yep. Do you remember that little history section at the beginning? That's very true. It's yep. very good. When Israel, with the Ark of the Covenant, they could defeat anybody. They're this little ransacked group of people who barely know how to fight. But they had the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God. And everywhere they went, the presence of God went and kicked everybody's butt. And that's, that's why it was so important. That's why Hitler was looking for it. But they lose this battle to the Philistines. And they come back and they all say, woe is me. Why did God do this to us? Now, for those of us in the New Testament, when we say that, we go, well, God doesn't play both sides of the chessboard. Satan is working. But Old Testament, Satan is a microscopic character. You got to recognize that or else you think that Satan just existed in the book of Matthew. But we understand from their perspective there's only Yahweh and the other gods. So they're asking this question. They come back to, to Samuel. And then on the way to see Samuel, they encounter Eli. Now, if you remember the story of Samuel, you realize Eli was the judge slash priest at the time. Eli is close to 100 years old. He is morbidly obese and he's blind. So you have this prophetic picture of the priesthood being morbidly obese and blind. And the other thing we know about Eli is he was a horrible dad. Just like all the dads in the Old Testament. Sorry, but it's true. Eli's sons, Hopi and Phinehas, were absolutely corrupt. Which is why the Spirit of God left the judges and went to Samuel and then goes to the kings. Does that make sense so far? Yes. Okay, little details, but they're going to come back in a second. Eli hears about the battle. He hears that his sons were killed. He doesn't respond much. But then came the news, and they stole the ark of God. When Eli heard that, he fell back, and because he was so rotund, he broke his neck, and he died. And you see this prophetic picture of the people of God not doing the job because they got fat and blind. Mm. Mm. Not going to touch it. Hophi's, Hophi was one of the sons. His wife goes into labor at that moment. She gives birth to the child. She looks at the child and she names it. Ika, Bod. Wow. Bod, glory, <laughs> departed. The glory has departed. Now, can we just agree in terms of parenting, naming your child after the worst thing that happened in a nation isn't very good? Right. I'd like to introduce you to my son, the Holocaust. I mean, <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? You think this kid didn't get his lunch money taken? That's not the point. But the point is the glory of God has departed from Israel and is now in the hands of his enemies. So I alluded to 2017, God wakes me up out of a dead sleep with one word, Ichabod. I start studying this, and I'm up for two hours in just this 
prophetic mess. I shared it with everybody at the church over three or four weeks. It was pretty powerful. When I told my mentor, he says, I need you to come to my church and preach that. And in 2017, America wasn't doing well. The world wasn't doing well. The church wasn't doing well. And the question is, did the glory leave the church? Well, again, that's Old Testament. We're New Testament. Does the glory ever leave believers? No. But is there a, a, an equivalent? Yeah. And we're going to get to that in a second. So the story goes on. The Philistines now have the Ark of the Covenant in their possession. The way it works in the Old Testament, after nation A defeats nation B, nation A goes to nation B's temple, takes all of their gods, takes all of its gods, goes to their temple, puts all the defeated nation's gods in their temple. Because every battle in the Old Testament is a battle between gods of different nations. That's why in 11 chapters... When Goliath comes down to fight for the Philistines and David comes down to fight for Israel, nobody flinches. Has it ever seemed weird to you why one man, mono a mono, could, could decide the nation, the fate of nations? Wow. Well, it's because they saw them as spiritual battles. It's not David versus Goliath, it's Yahweh versus Dagon. Right. Does that make sense? So they take the Ark of the Covenant, they put it in Dagon's temple. The next morning they come out, Dagon is face down over. in front of the ark. And they go, well, that's odd. So a few guys go and they prop up the god that wasn't working well. Wow. Say la. Yeah. Say la. Uh -huh. And they leave. The next morning, Dagon is back on his face again. This time his head is knocked off and his hands are knocked off. Yeah. And they realized Oh, we got a problem. And another thing happens. The nation of Philistia gets overrun by rats and legions. So everybody's got these massive legions on their skin and rats running around. Can we agree that's not what you want for your nation? <laughs> we may have high gas prices, but we don't all have legions and rats running around. Well, maybe in other parts of town. But, who's watching? Am I going to offend anybody? No, good. All right. So they realize we got a problem. We got to get rid of this ark, but we don't know how because they're terrified, as they should be. So they figure out, okay, we're going to send it back to the Jews, but we're going to make an offering as we send it back. And they, they made what is a rational decision for back then. We want their God to heal our legions, we want their God to get rid of our rats. How many of you know that should be what the world says about the church? Yes. Yeah. And sadly, the world is not sick. The world doesn't see the church as a place of hope anymore. Right. So the whole point in 2017 that that I, the big I shouldn't say the the biggest point is. When the glory of God is not in the house of God, society doesn't function. Mm. And that was 2017. And can we agree it's already gotten five years worse? Still the same. Worse. worse. So the story goes on. They go and they send the ark back. They send an offering with it. They get all this right. But the problem is when the ark, and by the way, they put it on a cart, the cow's just miraculous walk back to Israel. And the moment they crossed the borders of Israel, some guys were so excited they looked inside of the ark. Oh, bad news. Okay? Bad news. There's a proper way to handle the, the glory of God. And that wasn't it. Right? So now the people of Israel are terrified. Yeah, they were terrified when it departed. Now they're still a little terrified of now that it's back, what do we do? So they go to Saul, Samuel. Samuel says, here's what we do. And the whole nation repents. And the whole nation brings offerings back to God. Amen. And revival sweeps the land. 
and the ark comes back into Jerusalem. The glory of God is now back where it needs to be. Okay? And then the next story is they have a massive victory against the Philippines. <laughs> Tell I like Filipino food a lot because I made that same mistake. First service. <laughs> Philistines. And friends, can we clarify something? I know all of us are praying for revival. I've been praying since I was 16. But can we get something 100% set? God's not holding out on us. No. We don't have more compassion than God does. God isn't sitting here making us jump through a hoop for revival. He's waiting for Christians to live revived. Yes. There you go. That's how it happens. Yes, sir. That's how it happens. And we can jump up and down, and we can spin around, and we can wave flags, and we can sacrifice small animals. God is waiting for Christians to pour their life into people who don't believe in him yet. Amen. If you don't believe me, read the history of the Jesus movement. Lonnie Frisbee trips across Chuck Smith, and they decide, hey, let's go out and start sharing our faith. Boom. Anyway, that, it didn't say first. Anyway. So, at this point in the story, they all repent, they all bring offerings, they win a great victory against the Philistines. Amen? Amen. Cheer! Yay. There's great rejoicing. Yay. Uh, Welcome to Living Hope. I wish the story ended there. Here's the part that God impressed on me yesterday was the okay, and here's where the story goes. Samuel is now old. Remember how this story started? Eli was old. old. Samuel is about to die. They're saying, who should we turn the kingdom over to? Well, let's turn it over to Samuel's kids. But you know what the problem was? He didn't have good kids. Just like Eli didn't have good kids. Are you noticing the pattern? And so they said, well, well what are we going to do? And and guess what all the people said? Oh, by the way, when they repented, story before, they repented and Samuel said specifically, do not follow the gods of other nations. Yep. Did everybody catch that? Yeah. Okay. So now, they don't know who to handle, who's going to be in charge, and what do the people say? Who's the king? We want a king. That's statement A. Does anybody know statement B that comes right after it? Like the other nations, so the king will fight for us. Who's doing the math? They haven't grown much in the chapter. We want to be like other people. How, do, how does the world win wars? They get a bigger army. The more the merrier. The more people that agree with us, we're going to win. So what do, what do the people of Israel say? They say, we want a king. So Samuel goes back to God and says, do you hear these people? Didn't they remember what you just did? And God says to him, they're not going to like it, but give them a king. Once again. Sorry, so, so far in this story today, I have contrasted Old Testament with New Testament, correct? Yeah. Let's talk about something that's 100% correct through every page of the Bible. God gives us what we want, even to our own detriment. Yeah. There you go. And God gave them over. That, that's the judgment of God. Judgment of God isn't fireballs from the sky. Judgment of the God is saying to a guy like me, yeah, go ahead and eat everything you want. Yes. Yes. Lead me not into temptation, says God, don't give me what I want. So, so God says to Sam, yeah, they want a king, give them a king. So, so God tells them, and Samuel relays it to the people, you don't want a king. You can't handle the truth. 
He's going to take your money. He's going to take your sons. He's going to take your daughters. You don't want a king. And they said, like the toddler that they are, we want a king. Everybody else has a king. Because that's the way the world does it. And then God said something very powerful. He says, give them a king, but understand, they're not rejecting you, Saul, Samuel. They're rejecting me. They're rejecting me. Yes, sir. And this comes to the second prophetic word. Oh, oh, I gotta fill in one more piece of the puzzle. How many people remember the Tower of Babel? Yes. 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 Uh, you read the first few chapters of Genesis, God's experiment with mankind it is not going well. In the, in the final straw, after Noah's Ark, you think Noah's Ark is the final straw? It's not. Wait, do I have it backwards? <coughs> Maybe Noah's Ark is the final straw. Setting up the final straw. The next, to, <laughs> the next to the final straw, Tower of Babel. And what happened there? Humans united. We got this. All of us together, we can take care of everything. Same problem they had with, you know, a few stories later in Samuel. Here's the second prophetic word God gave me that he reminded me of yesterday. I was at a regional worship event, a number of churches getting together, and God gave me a prophetic word. Now, our church is in the Pentecostal charismatic tradition. Okay? Pentecostal charismatic tradition absolutely believes the Spirit of God is meant to back up the message of the Word of God. And believers yeah. will lay hands upon the sick and they will recover, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you remember all this? Yeah. But, who are we kidding? We're not seeing the power of God flow like we might have even seen 100 years ago. Right. Or 40 years ago, well, 60 years ago now. I mean, we've talked about the voice of healing. Amy Simple McPherson was yes. still holding her massive... Revivals, and you had Catherine Coleman, and you had um, uh, young Laurel Roberts, and you had all of these massive healing revivals going on. And we're not seeing it like we used to. We have bigger churches. We have better looking Christian theater. We don't have the power of God. Right. Say a lot. Yes. And I was in. I was in this worship event, and I was just praying to God about. And he reminded me of the passage where Esau sells his birthright for a bowl of beans. Maybe it was chili. Maybe it was at least chili. I like to think it was at least chili. Not lentils. <laughs> Not lentils. And, and I just was, was crying. Why don't we have our birthright of seeing the, the physical healings that we used to see? John G. Lake and Smith Wigglesworth and, and all of these yeah. people whose name we know. Right, right, right. And what I sensed God saying is, and again, if I give a, a prophetic word like this, you test it out. Okay? Don't just take what I say uh, with, without testing it out yourself. And what I sensed was, God said, the baby boomers sold their birthright for a bowl of beans called social acceptance. Yes. Boom. I remember the first time I'm sitting home with my grandparents. My grandma received the power of the Holy Spirit as a six-year-old girl with my great-grandma in a little house church pastored by a woman, probably a four-square one because they're the only ones sending women anywhere. Okay, I'm a fifth-generation Pentecostal when it's only been in the country for three. So this is, this is what I grew up with. Baby boomers sold their birthright of spiritual power for a bowl of beef, for social acceptance. We have bigger churches. We have corners of political prowess. Gen X. We sold our birthright of spiritual power for pseudo-intellectualism. Our generation got caught up in Calvinism like it was crack. Good God, it did. 
And, and I watched, when I started my church in Kirkland, right across the water in Seattle, Mark Driscoll started his church, Mars Hill, and he was just completely infatuated with John Piper and Timothy Keller and all of the Calvinists. And you have this picture where Christianity looks like that God is as angry as these young men are. And God, that church went from 14,000 in nine states to nothing. Boomers wanted social acceptance. General, Gen Xers wanted into pseudo-intellectual prowess because the Calvinists always sounded smarter. They didn't talk about the power of God. They didn't talk about prayer languages. They didn't talk about the second coming of Jesus because it's not sophisticated. Right? Right? And then today and yesterday I started praying. Oh, Lord. Where have the millennials? Oh, and by the way, Gen X didn't do a great job reaching their kids. And I say this to my grief. I say this to my mourning. I was the generation of youth pastors that didn't reach our kids the way we should have. Now, I'm thrilled today. Joseph from one of my youth groups is sitting here because that's pretty darn cool. Mm -hmm. The problem is I can pinpoint when I should. And, and millennials, desperately, they want group think. They're, they're selling their birthright for a belief that we all need to think the same thing, and if you don't think the same as me, we're coming after your jugular. Remember God and free will? Mm -hmm. Coming after the jugular of people who disagree with you isn't godly, folks. If you don't believe me, ask Islam. That's how they act. And then I said, well, Lord, how, what, what, what's it going to be for Gen Z? And again, test this out. If you don't agree, you don't have to. You don't have to. I mean, this, is, this is just what I said God said. He said Gen Z is selling its birthright for radical individualism. <laughs> This is why Gen Z is so obsessed with defining themselves. And have you noticed people tend to define themselves by things that are killing ourselves? Yeah. yeah. You've got a whole generation of kids who are defining themselves by genital activity. Can I just say, when you reduce human beings to genital preferences, you completely strip the glory of God from a human being. Yeah. Think about it. You have so much greater potential. Well put. Yeah. They're just well saying this, put. right? Yeah. Well put. And we say this lovingly because we're still compelled to reach. Yes. Yes. To love. Yes. And all of this is coming to one final point. The American church has stopped being the hope of the nation. But do we have a hope for radical individualism? Absolutely. The more you look like Jesus, the less you look like anybody else. The more you pick up your cross, the less you feel like a copycat of anyone. Every, every dictator who slaughtered millions seemed pretty similar. Hitler, Stalin, Pol Pot, Baby Duck, Chevalier. It doesn't matter. They all wanted all the power. They're going to kill everybody else. Fairly similar. No two radical disciples look anything alike. And if you've ever heard Catherine Coleman and you ever heard Billy Graham, there might not be two people on the planet more opposite. <laughs> but did they make an absolute indent on the planet? Lord, yes. Yes. There is no way someone becomes more individual than following Jesus aggressively. Amen. Does the Christian church have a message for millennials who want to have groupthink? In a matter of speaking, when disciples get together, we can have some of the greatest conversations while still affirming the fact that people may believe differently. We're, 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 we're not Islamic. We don't believe that if you disagree with us, you either bow your knee to Allah or... Right? Right? So it's not necessarily groupthink, but we certainly have a relationship and community... Does, does God have an answer for Gen X and the desire to be intellectual? Of course he does. 
God wants your brain really wide. He wants your spirit really deep. We worship in spirit and deep. deep. Spirit and now, does God have a desire for Christians to have social acceptance? Well, that might be a little different. As Jesus said, they will hate you, but they hated me first. There will come a time when they will kill you, and they will say that they are doing God a favor. But it doesn't mean we still aren't the light of the world. Zacchaeus was the most hated man in the country. Mm. Jesus said to everybody, salvation's come to that guy's house. And they go, him? He's the one we want you to... Jesus, he needs a smile. <laughs> People who were fighting against Jesus clamored to be around him. And that's the part the Jesus generation figured out. How do you go and compel them to come in? We haven't. believe. Jesus is the greatest hope of our nation and our world and our kids and our grandkids and our friends. How? Amen. But it starts with Christians picking up the cross. And then it goes to disciples picking up the cross. We can't just wear it around our neck. Thank you for putting up with this. Um, you're going to have two marginal messages and then the good one. So pace yourself. But I, I, I really had to make sure you realized that when Israel wanted a king, it was not God's will. And, and again, I just got tapped on the shoulder again. Somebody here this week is going to have a conversation with somebody who's going to blame God for something the devil's doing. <laughs> and you have the opportunity to tell them. All powerful means all can all resourceful, not all control. God doesn't micromanage the planet. God doesn't play both sides of the chessboard. For this reason, the Son of Man is revealed to destroy the works of the evil one. God doesn't cause sickness, so Jesus can heal. God doesn't give people cancer. He doesn't have cancer to give. And you're going to set somebody free by just saying, God's will is almost never done on the planet, mm -hmm. except by people who agree with Jesus. Planes flying into Twin Towers, not God's will. No. Cops and firemen running upstairs while a building is falling Downstairs. down, God's, God's will. Amen. Fair? Yep. Jesus, in your name, we're just so grateful that you're doing so many incredible things. We just want to align our lives again. We want to prophetically say, here I am. Send me. Yes, God. Let your kingdom come, let your will be done in our lives. Jesus, we set this whole church at your feet, knowing full well there are heartbroken people within spitting distance of here. Help us as individuals become the hope for the nation. Yes. So that your church can once again be the light of the world that you call it to be. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Thank you. And friends, I just got tapped on the shoulder one more time. Please understand something. In the midst of all of this, Christians still should work to improve the life of society. Amen. Yes. Okay. Did everybody hear that? Yes. Okay. But we can't worship at that idol. Yes. This still is never going to be heaven. There's a reason we call this earth. It doesn't mean you don't make tangible steps. Okay. We, we aren't waiting for the rapture as a get off of earth free card. Right. Right. So Jesus in your name. And we just thank you. And everybody said, Amen. 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 And Lord, bless the food, bless the hands that prepared it. Yes. And we're just grateful for everything you're doing. And everyone said again. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.